we're going to be focusing on another Sputnik moment related to clean technology revolution around this whole nexus of food, energy, and water. And uh, this nexus of food, energy, and water, we sometimes globally treat these as three different buckets, but they're so integrated with each other. We can't afford, as a global community, as a nation, as an R&D enterprise here in the United States, to treat them in a, in, a, in a separated fashion. Their integration is really, really important for us. And so um, it's really interesting to have a panel discussion around technology, uh, the technology revolution that's going to help us address the issues related to this nexus of food, energy, and water. And you know, you can all put on top of this nexus politics, population growth, climate change in particular. All of these things are forcing functions that are directly impacting this nexus of food, energy, and water. And one of the things that we can do as a council and as advocates for the R&D enterprise here and for policy development is to really accelerate clean technology adoption to help this nexus. So um, I'm really honored to have two panelists with me. I'm Taylor Amy. I'm the president of the University of Texas at San Antonio. I have a, the best job in the world. <laughs> we get to do great things in San Antonio, including having a football team that's going to a bowl game. Um, um, next Friday night, watch it on TV. Uh, um, more importantly, though, I believe deeply in the purpose of the council. It is a voice that is needed now more than ever. We talked earlier about this Sputnik opportunity. We're at a special moment with the Biden administration, with the way Congress is, is set up, especially for the next two years, to make continued progress around rapid innovation in support of our enterprise and our competitiveness at a global stage. And so um, what I want to do as I introduce my two distinguished colleagues is frame their role. You can read their bios in the program. Frame their roles of their institutions relative to this nexus of food, energy, and water. So directly to my left is my good friend and colleague, Gary May, he's the chancellor at UC Davis. It's one of the <coughs> flagship institutions of the University of California system. There are others, but his is the most interesting <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> I, I get to say that today. Uh, tomorrow I might change my mind, but today yeah. it's one of the most interesting ones. It's interesting in its location uh, in Central California near the Valley. It's interesting because of its focus on, on uh, things in their research enterprise related to food, agriculture, health, sustainability. There's a huge footprint at UC Davis in their research space. They're a billion dollar a year research enterprise at UC Davis, it's huge. And they have such a focus that aligns with food, energy, and water that it makes Gary being here a very good uh, uh, transformative discussion opportunity for us. What I'd like to point out is that his, his budget of his institution is $5 billion. He has 40,000 students. He has a healthcare system, UC Davis healthcare system that's affiliated with UC Davis. Um, they have obviously this wonderful focus on science and climate, food production, healthcare. He has this really interesting thing called a big ideas accelerator and he generates all sorts of multidisciplinary approaches to grand challenges that we, that we face in California, in his area of California, California nationally, globally. And I'll just give you an example of disruptive technology that they're focusing on. They have an AI intelligence institute for next generation food systems. And you knew that, right? I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, so you knew that. <laughs> okay. Now, to my far left is Greg Hill, <laughs> the president and COO of Hess Corporation. Just so you know, Greg was very instrumental in helping the council hold its uh, Mountain West Innovation Summit this past summer, so thank you for that, Greg. Hess is a Fortune 500 company. They're 32nd in market capitalization amongst global oil and gas companies with $41 billion of, of, of capitalization. They have reserves that are, are proven, about 1.3 billion barrels. They have about 11 years on their reserve life. They produce about 315,000 barrels per day of oil equivalent hydrocarbons. But more interestingly, they have aspirations to be a top quartile sustainability enterprise in the oil and gas sector. 
they recently, I was fascinated to read this, they recently did a, a very important business deal with the government of Guyana around carbon credits and, and, and support of rainforests in Suriname and Guyana. That was a $750 million investment. They recently participated in a Goldman Sachs Global Energy Clean Technologies Conference earlier this year to discuss their efforts in technology innovation. And they recently made a gift in this nexus of food, energy, and water. They recently made a gift of $12.5 million to the Salk Institute for storing <clears throat> carbon in plants. So both perspectives, the corporate perspective, <clears throat> the university knowledge perspective, both institutions have deep connectivity to this nexus of food, energy, and water. And with that, I want to start off by throwing some questions out to my, my panelists. And so um, what I'd like to do is, is start first with Greg. Greg, from a, from a Hess Corp perspective, can you share your views on the role of the oil and gas industry in clean, in this clean technology revolution that we're needing yeah, right now? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, you know, I thought the, uh, the way the last panel ended talking about a Sputnik moment, I think we're actually on a Sputnik moment in the U.S. on how we think about energy policy. Right, um, because the absolute center of competitiveness for the United States is clean, reliable, uh, sustainable energy. And right now, you know, that mix is all oil and gas. So I don't, all of you know this, but I'll repeat some facts. <clears throat> you know, 80%, 79% in 2021 of the world's energy came from hydrocarbons. And if you look at oil and gas, that was about 53% of the mix. So we are solely dependent on um, hydrocarbons. And then if you look at you know, where energy demand's going, it's gonna go up about 20% between now and 2050 as the world comes out of poverty and, and uh, GDP continues to grow, which is an absolute necessity. And the IEA, they did, recently did three scenarios. I think you ought to look at them because I think they're very informative about where energy is headed. And I won't go into all of them, but, but there was one called stated policies where if the world just, you know, executes the policies that are in place, if you look at oil and gas, that's going to be 49% of the mix in 2040. So it's 53 today. It'll be 29 or 49% of the mix. They have another scenario called announced pledges, and that's where all of the pledges made by all of the countries in the world all of the pledges made by all of the companies in the world, if they execute their climate change plans um, according to plan, on budget, on time, hydrocarbons are still going to be 40% of the mix, 40 of the mix right? And then IEA also put together this net zero scenario. It's a totally unrealistic scenario, but it says if we want to be net zero by 2050, what do, what do we have to do? And even in that scenario, hydrocarbons are 25% of the mix. So where do I think we're going to land? I think we're going to land somewhere between the 49 and 40% of the energy mix um, being hydrocarbons for, you know, in 2040, right? So if you think about that, what the world, so the issue with hydrocarbons, why, why are they so, important well they nothing can compete with them in terms of their cost and their efficiency their portability i mean all of the all of the factors that drove their energy density um, and plus it permeates every aspect of our lives so the clean technology revolution cannot occur without access to hydrocarbons you can't build a wind turbine you can't build a solar panel you can't have high speed, high speed computing you can't have any of these things without you know, reliable and affordable energy. So it's gonna be here for a very long time. So the challenge with hydrocarbons is how do we reduce the emissions footprint, which is what we're very focused on in addition to investing in new technology. So does, do, I, should, I should know this and I don't, does HES mm -hmm. have a focus on carbon capture as one of the technologies? We do, so we've got a couple, uh, we've got one pilot in particular that we're gonna do in Asia um, because we have a reservoir that it makes sense, right? We can inject it right, right into the ground below us. Um, and I think that's one, one technology that absolutely has to be part of the mix because the, 
Yeah. You know, I, I don't think of it as an energy transition. I think of it as an energy expansion, right? Um, where you're expanding the energy mix, eventually you'll get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner as you go through time. But, it, but it's going to take a long time, and it's going to take a lot of investment. And I think as soon as the world admits that, and we have an honest conversation, a, you know, I should have said, I'm here as a scientist. I'm not here as an oil executive. I'm here as a scientist. And the, and the facts and data and the numbers, you just cannot deny. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Gary, the, this concept of clean energy is an important mm -hmm. one. I know UC Davis is interested in this from an um, education perspective, an R&D perspective. Thinking about our situation nationally, we have to achieve you know, net zero emissions by mid-century if we can. And to do that, the U.S. is really going to have to focus on generating electricity using carbon net zero sources, electrifying industries, working on storage systems, working on the grid, uh, expanding alternative and renewable energy, that, that mix that we're talking mm -hmm. about for our energy portfolio as we go forward. And a lot has to happen. So the U.S. Congress and the Biden administration are making, as you know, historic investments in clean energy, for example, in tax incentives, loans, loan guarantees, R&D demonstrations. Will these <coughs> incentives and investments accelerate the deployment of renewable energy production at the rates needed to try and get to the 2035 goal? So do you have a sense of what's happening in the energy sector to drive faster deployment to get to Sputnik sooner? Uh, from your perspective, and you should share also that you're, you have a background in electrical engineering and material science. Yeah. You're a chip person yourself, so yeah. you under, take it away. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, first, thanks for having me, and thank you to the council for having this important panel. I should mention just one fact that you missed in my introduction from my university. One attribute that's very important is we're number one in the world in wine. So when you come visit us, <laughs> yeah. when you come visit us in March, you'll get a chance. We'll get wait, a chance wait, to prove that to you. You so. have a great relationship with Mars Corporation around we do. around the. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amen. And, that, and, and dog food. Wine and chocolate. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> so, yeah. thank you. Um, so, uh, let me just start by saying it's safe to say I think that uh, the incentives that the administration has proposed will at least help galvanize the next tranche of investment uh, in, in capital uh, renewal. Um, the question really is, are those incentives going to be enough? And um, I can tell you that in higher ed and academia, uh, there's a genuine diversity of opinion on, on that question. Uh, uh, including from an engineering perspective as opposed to an economic perspective. Uh, at UC Davis, some of our researchers believe that um, incentives are the way to go. Um, uh, incentives or subsidies are going to be effective in stimulating investment as renewables uh, and electric vehicle infrastructure is improved. Um, it will expand supply of energy and demand for uh, these electric vehicles, but Will it actually reduce emissions, uh, something that Greg alluded to? Um, and there's not complete agreement on whether that will happen. Uh, two of our researchers, I'll just mention, uh, David Rapson and, and James Bushnell, uh, addressed this very topic in a paper they titled, The Electric Ceiling, Limits and Costs of Fuel Electrification. Uh, and they question whether 100% uh, electrification of transportation will reduce the amount of gas burned uh, and therefore reduce emissions. Uh, to the extent that's being projected under these different decarbonization scenarios. Uh, subsidies for green tech will reduce emissions to the extent that it reduces uh, use of brown tech, but, but these researchers, Rapson and Bushnell, point out that in California, which actually leads the nation in the number of EVs, and you can see that if you drive around, mm -hmm. uh, these vehicles are typically additional cars, not the primary vehicle of most of the owners, right? So uh, they're not going to be replacements, at least currently not replacements for gas vehicles. So in addition to incentives, uh, if we wanted to reduce emissions, we need to make uh, it expensive to pollute, which means we need to have the political will to have carbon, a price on carbon, uh, which we thus far have not had, but we need something similar to that if we're gonna reduce emissions. So I applaud the, admission, uh, the administration, excuse me, investments and efforts to accelerate the transitions from fossil fuels to clean energy, and I think we need to continue the, the vigorous debate that is going on, but, uh, and to work together across disciplines to promote uh, necessary innovation that will help us to achieve those goals. Yeah, good point. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of interesting things out there in the clean energy technology revolution that's happening right now. We, we're mm -hmm. trying to manage over or under investment. We're trying to allocate it correctly. We have a federal investment, a private sector investment. Um, Greg, you're, and from your perspective, your company invests in technologies. Mm -hmm. You have an R&D enterprise mm -hmm. that is 
put in place, and you, you are standing up boldly as a company to be a sustainable partner in all of this uh, globally. So, um, but I'm curious to, as to your perspective, what steps need to be taken to encourage robust investments of venture capital into the clean energy technology yeah. space? <clears throat> Boy, that's a really good question. And you know, my colleague to my right, you know, he's right. I mean, the amount of investment that needs to occur, we're woefully short. Yeah. I mean, just if you pick the middle of that IEA scenario that I talked about where, you know, maybe hydrocarbons are 45% of the mix, um, you know, in, in uh, 2040, um, the amount of investment that just needs to go into oil and gas has to go up by 50%. The amount of investment that needs to go up into clean tech has to go up by 80%. And if you, and so that's a trillion dollars more going into clean tech. That's about 200 billion more, you know, going into um, oil and gas. So the amount of invest, this is the other thing I don't think the real world has really realized is just how much investment it's going to take to be, even begin this transition. Yeah, even just, let's say, for carbon capture technology. Absolutely, it's a huge I mean, and, yeah. and so where's the money gonna come from? Will the capital be there? Um, I think, you know, the, the government's gotta do its part, but there also has to be, there has, for the private sector, there has to be returns. And, you know, without, in the absence of returns, it's gonna fall more on the government um, and, and the partnerships that we talked about this morning um, but also, I agree with my colleague that, you know, we got to get, we got to have a conversation about a carbon tax because you also have to attack the demand side. I mean, you know, look at this room. Do we really need all these lights? <laughs> Do we, but, but this is the problem, right? <clears throat> I mean, nobody wants to give up anything um, in the interest of lowering demand and so if I think about future technologies, obviously capture, carbon capture storage, that's right down our wheelhouse. Um, if you look at where emissions are coming from, only 13% is transport. And only half of that is light duty. The other half's heavy duty. The remaining 75% of the pie is making stuff. So about 30% cement, steel, plastics, um, you know, for example. 25% is generating electricity, and then the other 20% is ag. So your, ag. your technologies have got to address all three of those. So, you know, if I look forward and say, okay, decarbonizing hydrocarbons, that's CCUS, something like that, because there will be sectors you can't decarbonize. Um, and then I think about the electric, tr electricity sector, you gotta go nukes. So I'm really interested in, you know, particular modular nuclear technology. We've got a really close watching brief on that, where that goes. Um, and then, you know, uh, behind that, of course, is hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is hard. It's expensive, um, you know, and, and so there's a combinatory effect of energy, uh, cheap energy, driving it, electrolysis, et cetera, et cetera. Hydrogen would solve the storage problem and the transport problem. So if I, if I was putting my money, that's where I'd go. CCUS, you know, hydrogen, um, you know, um, and nuclear. I mean, the world's got to get their minds around nuclear. We have to do that, and you know, we can talk about this later. But there's policy issues here as well. So the people that are protesting about climate change are protesting infrastructure. They're protesting nuclear. They're protesting everything. And that's where the government has to step in, to me, with a coherent energy policy, backed up with a technology innovation policy or strategy, and just lead. Um, quick follow-up question. Do you think that the venture capital community would be more in as an investment source if we had a carbon tax uh, system Absolutely. in place, is that the first driver that needs to be? I, I think so, I think that would definitely encourage it, right? Because yeah. there would be more capital available. Yeah. And you have, to put the, you have to put the onus on the consumer ultimately to change behavior, you know, because it's the behavior that is driving supply or consumption. 
Um, we have two topics we wanted to discuss in our panel. The first was around uh, uh, clean energy technology. The other gets us back to this incredibly complex nexus of food, energy, and water. So, Gary, you think about this a lot. Your institution thinks about it a lot. Where are the key leverage points for investments to achieve the greatest gains in meeting the challenges at the intersection of this very complex integrated system? Yeah, um, you have policy institutes that worry about this. We do, in fact. Yeah. I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, and as you mentioned, UC Davis is one of the top uh, programs in the, in the nation, if not the world, in agriculture uh, with deep expertise uh, in many different aspects of agriculture. Our researchers have helped conduct the first international assessment of water <coughs> use for energy production and develop rigorous methods for yep. uh, 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 applications and quanti that quantify and value the energy savings accrued through water conservation methods in ag. Uh, we've completed detailed environmental impact assessments, uh, including water and energy use uh, for grape and rice cultivation, for tomato processing, uh, brewing facilities, uh, to name just a few. So there are many opportunities uh, for investment to accelerate technologies and practices that can address uh, resource uh, uh, efficiency and sustainability in the food, energy, uh, water nexus. At a high level, energy um, and water become embedded in food uh, as a result of agricultural practices, including harvesting and post-harvest processing, handling, processing, packaging, distribution, retail, and consumption of, of the food. And there are leverage points for investment in each of those uh, supply chain elements. Yeah. Um, equally important are the water and energy embedded in uh, the, sig the significant fraction uh, of lost and wasted food that occurs uh, due to culling of crops and spoilage, overstock at retail, and <laughs> non-consumption by, by consumers, so waste. And as a result, production management, pr preservation, and consumer awareness tools uh, uh, also represent uh, uh, potential potent leverage points for new technology. Um, at a systems level, there's opportunities for improved information technology that integrates uh, data across food, energy, and water as well. Um, and I think if we explore all of those areas, I think that's, that's really the direction that we need to be headed uh, to make improvements. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Um, Greg, the, the, the notion of this complex food and energy water nexus being a system that has to be managed holistically, uh, there's a lot of discontinuity across the three, the three buckets right now in terms of how we manage from a policy perspective, a technology perspective, yeah. an integration perspective. In your world, the things that you do in oil and gas, you mm -hmm. are integrating things all the time. Mm -hmm. If you were to put your integration hat on, what would you think about applying how you do that to this nexus of these three buckets? What would you be doing for a Sputnik moment here around well, food, energy, and water? You know, we did talk about a lot of that really in the last panel. You know, it's got to be, it, to me, it starts with policy, right? So the first thing we have to do is, is have a coherent policy around these things. And so, but I, I actually believe that the first thing that we have to do is educate policy makers in these things. I give an example, and you know, in, in our business, you know, we, we find a lot of policy makers that are fairly well educated on climate. They're not well educated at all on energy, and they're not well educated at all on economics. Yeah. And I think about food, and I think about water, and there's massive education gaps in our policymakers in, in all of these. Once we kind of can get that education and we have to do that cooperatively through things like the Council on Competitiveness, then once we get that education, then I think the next policy that has to occur is an energy security policy because we only have to look at Europe where and, and a policy that was driven largely by emotion um, now has them in a complete mess, right? And so I think we have to think through a very logical energy policy that then can enable all this innovation, you know, et cetera, um, and then double, triple down the yep. innovation spend for sure. Um, and then I, I mentioned this before, I think we also, we've got to think about NEPA reform. I mean, we just have to crack this Gordian knot of 20 years for a permit to do most anything anywhere. I mean, you know, we can't, we can't operate under those time frames no. and expect to make a difference, right? And, and it cuts across 
water, it cuts across food, cuts across energy, it cuts across the entire thing. And so to me, that is a absolutely necessary thing that we have to do. Especially with the urgency we have now for the need absolutely. around this, this No, ab yeah. absolutely. And you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues at the table and you know, there's some tough choices here. I mean, why does the driest place in the United States have the, more, the most golf courses per capita of anywhere else in the world? Does that make any sense? You know, but, but, but these, are the, these are the things we're gonna have to tackle, but that requires leadership at the policy level, but it starts with understanding all the problems we're trying to solve and how do we get the politics out of the room? I mean, that's got to be it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, uh, thank you for that, Greg. Uh, yeah. Gary, you and I live in states that have robust <clears throat> energy economies, have robust agricultural economies, especially California. Uh, and we have equally challenging, if not intractable, water resource availability yeah. issues. And so yeah. one of the things I was, I didn't do enough homework on your AI artificial Intelligence Institute for Next Generation Food Systems, but it strikes me that UC Davis has a pretty interesting focus here around entrepreneurship and innovation as exemplified by that institute around this whole idea of the nexus of food, energy, and water. And you're thinking about new materials, new chemicals, life sciences, digitalization, data mobility, clean energy, this integrated system of systems. Of, how do you accelerate innovation in your ecosystem in Central California at UC Davis with everybody that congregates around what you do because you are the UC system school that does this the best? How do you rapidly innovate with all of the creative capital out there? Well, Taylor, I think first we need to just bring together all the experts and stakeholders across the many fields mm -hmm. and disciplines and agencies that enable systems level solutions to these food, energy, water nexus uh, problems. Uh, and we can be a good convener for that as, as given our role that you described. Especially as a land grant institution. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, uh, to, you know, just to address the, the importance of food loss and, and waste in, the, in this food, energy, water nexus, uh, we established a food loss waste collaborative to col collaborate, I'm sorry, to coordinate multidisciplinary research uh, in this area. And uh, we've joined with researchers in American University and 13 other institutions uh, for a, a five-year project funded by uh, the NSF. Uh, you know, food ends up as uh, a landfill waste and uh, uh, wastes money and, and generates greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And this is a great example. This just this uh, uh, collaboration uh, is designed to address that. And it's a great example of better coordination and information sharing. Um, uh, optimization, I'm sorry, optimization really begins with understanding, as, yeah. as Greg was saying. Um, uh, uh, you know, how is water uh, and energy becoming embedded in various food products? How does processing uh, affect resource intensity? How does, uh, how, what are the environmental impacts uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, ecotoxicity, and land transformation of all these activities? It really just takes convening of expertise and long-term vision and solutions of uh, uh, identification to address these issues. And you guys are doing that all the time at UC Davis. We have about a minute left in our panel discussion, <clears throat> and so I want to give each of you 30 seconds to have your Sputnik moment yeah. around, I <clears throat> like this Sputnik thing a lot. <laughs> I like this, yeah. Um, uh, so Greg, 30 seconds, what do you think the call to action needs to be beyond what you just mentioned about NEPA? What would be the call to action to accelerate innovation, clean energy technology innovation? I, th I think um, it's this conversation that we need to have about the realities of what we're trying to do, the problems we're trying to solve, how long it's gonna take, and how do we think about energy and, and having access to reliable, affordable energy because that drives our competitiveness as a nation. Make no mistake about it, our energy costs are the biggest single competitive advantage other than the talent that we have in That's this country. Very valid point. Yeah. Great, thank you, Greg. Yeah. Gary, 10 seconds. Well, I won't be able to do it in 10 seconds, but I will say my students would say, what's Sputnik? Um, <laughs> <laughs> There We're many, dating ourselves. That's a, good, yeah. that's a good point too. Yeah. There, there are so many areas and opportunities. Uh, everything from 
crop breeding, uh, precision agriculture, uh, water resource management, and there's just many opportunities. I just will say those opportunities are also economic opportunities and business opportunities yeah. as well. It's not just for making things better and making us feel good. There are actually some return on investment that can be expected. Business proposition if, behind if, all if we of do these things yeah. exactly. Yeah. And also with carbon capture, it's a huge Absolutely. business proposition. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us for our panel discussion. Greg, thank you. Gary, thank you. We thank appreciate you. the opportunity to have this conversation. Thanks, everyone.